Welcome to Strictly Facts, a guide to Caribbean history and culture, hosted by me, Alexandria Miller. Strictly Facts teaches the history, politics, and activism of the Caribbean and connects these themes to contemporary music and popular culture. Walk on Strictly Facts fam, I hope you've been enjoying our journey throughout Caribbean history as much as I have. Today's episode is the first in a two-part discussion on a new island we haven't traveled to yet, Cuba. While parts of the world solely associate Cuba with communism, the revolution of the 1950s, and the Castro regime, there are centuries worth of activism that sometimes goes untold. October 7th marks 154 years since Cuba's declaration of independence from Spain. In commemoration of this historic day, I'll be sharing a brief synopsis in this first episode, followed by a more in-depth discussion in two weeks, so make sure you stay tuned in. After being a Spanish colony since the late 15th century and following Haiti's example, Cuban attorney and enslaver Carlos Manuel de Cepedes initiated the declaration that led to the island's long battle for independence. Inspired by growing dissatisfaction with the colonial government, Cepedes and his planter class allies in eastern Cuba issued the Grito de Yara, or the Cry of Yara, on October 10, 1868, declaring independence from Spain. Among some of his proclamations, Cepedes wrote, and I quote, Our aim is to enjoy the benefits of freedom for whose use God created man. We sincerely profess a policy of brotherhood, tolerance, and justice, and to consider all men equal. The manifesto also wrote, our aim is to abolish slavery and to compensate those deserving of compensation, an important point for our follow-up discussion in two weeks. The declaration initiated the first of a series of wars over the next 30 years for Cuban liberation against Spain. The first war, the Ten Years' War, was fought primarily between Cuban-born planters on the east and more recent wealthy immigrants from Spain in the west with enslaved Africans and Chinese indentured servants on both sides, as well as volunteers from other islands like the Dominican Republic fighting on the behalf of the East. Cepedes was appointed as the first president of Cuba in arms in 1868 and led the Eastern military until 1873 when he was deposed in a leadership coup. He was killed the following year in a surprise attack after the Cuban government refused to let him go into exile. He is honored today as the Padre de la Patria, or the father of the homeland or country. The Ten Years' War went on until May 28, 1878, with Spain's resources holding up against the eastern insurgents. The war ended with the signing of the Pact of Zanjón, which granted political reforms like a new constitution, a provisional government, and greater autonomy for Cuba as well as freedom for the enslaved who fought on behalf of Spain. It did not, however, grant Cuba independence. Nationalist activism persisted, and the second war for independence, the Little War, occurred between 1879 and 1880. Similar to Cepedes, Calixo Garcia issued a manifesto and led the one-year rebellion, which was quickly suppressed by the Spanish military. The final war, the Cuban War of Independence, arose 15 years later, lasting from 1895 to 1898. Driven in part by support for the Cuban diaspora, U.S. government, and other nations and colonies in Latin America, which was spearheaded by nationalist José Martí, Cuba went to war with Spain yet again. Martí cites the following as his outline for the reinvigorated movement for independence in his Manifesto of Monte Cristi signed on March 25th, 1895. First, that the war would be waged by Blacks and whites alike. Second, that the Black population's participation was essential for victory. Third, that Spaniards who did not object to the war should be spared. Fourth, that private rural property should not be damaged. And last, the final point, that the revolution should bring about new economic life to Cuba. Spain was simultaneously trying to thwart independence movements in both the Philippines and Puerto Rico, with U.S. interest in Cuba as, and I quote, a rich island, end quote, that the Secretary of State at the time, James G. Blaine, believed the U.S. did not want Cuba to fall under any other European domination, 
and after the explosion of the USS Maine Navy ship in Havana Harbor, the U.S. stepped up in support of Cuba for the last three months of the war, what we now know as the Spanish-American War. From April to August 1898, the Cuban military continued to fight Spain, this time with U.S. intervention. The war ended that summer with Spain having lost the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Cuba through the Treaty of Paris. Following the treaty, Cuba became a protectorate of the U.S. and gained its formal independence four years later on May 20th, 1902. There's a future episode we have lined up on the renowned Cuban Revolution, but I had to share this background in advance of our guest episode where we'll share and discuss 19th century Cuban activism more in depth. For more context on this part of Cuba's independence movement, check out Cuban Emigres and Independence in the 19th Century Gulf World by Dalia Antonia Mueller and Cuba Libre, a 500-year quest for independence by Philip Brenner and Peter Eisner. Now, in the meantime, I beg you to do me a favor. I'd love to have and feature all of your voices in a future episode. So send us a short voicemail describing your personal or your family's personal involvement in Caribbean history. There is a tab to the right of our website, strictlyfactspod.com, where you can send us a short memo. I look forward to hearing your stories. See you in two weeks. Little more. Thanks for tuning in to Strictly Facts. Visit strictlyfactspodcast.com for more information from each episode. Follow us at Strictly Facts Pod on Instagram and Facebook and at Strictly Facts PD on Twitter.